A declarative sentence. Uh, Marty made a confession. It's good that the elder preacher slash preacher gets up. The first thing he does in the morning is he, he confesses. So I thought I'd follow suit, make my confession. And my confession is I want to go to heaven. No matter what happens here on earth, the one thing that will make it all worthwhile is that after death I will open my eyes and find myself in heaven. Doesn't matter what happens here, good or bad, doesn't matter what happens here. Only if I open my eyes and I see the Lord. And I don't think this is a unique thought or desire. I believe that if asked, most people would want the same thing. I never heard anybody say, you know, well, I can't wait to go to hell, find out what that's like. <laughs> of course not. So the problem in our world is not the desire of mankind to go to heaven. The problem is that there are several heavens being marketed out there. So this evening I'd like to review with you the various heavens that are being promoted so that you will know the difference and also hopefully describe to you the one that we are truly called to. So the seven heavens, here they are. The first heaven, material heaven. Material heaven, this is the heaven that atheists are striving for. Atheists are those who believe that this physical universe is the only thing that exists. They come in all shapes and sizes. They're either secular humanists who believe that man is at the center of everything, or they're communists who believe that the state is in the center of everything, or they're evolutionists who believe that, quote, nature is at the center of everything. Regardless of the type, atheists seek their heavenly reward here on this earth. It may be fame or wealth or power or pleasure or advanced intellectual achievement. Even the pleasure of making this world a better place somehow. But material heaven is the one where all you're going to get is now in this life because there's nothing after it's over. That's material heaven. Next, number two, mystic heaven. Mystic heaven, the mystic heaven is the paradise promoted by most Eastern and Far Eastern religions. It's the heaven of the Hindus, the Buddhists, and all the ancient nature religions like Native American and African and South American religions. It is the heaven of the ancient fables and gods and goddesses of the Greeks. Mystic heavens of all types, for example, you are uh, immersed or swallowed up by the great force of the universe. Call it what you want. Hindus call it Brahma. Or you join the pantheon of gods. The Greeks or native uh, peoples uh, believe this. There are no historical foundations for the mystic heavens. Simply stories and legends intertwined and handed down from generation to generation to generation. The problem with mystic heaven is that the nature of the place and the requirements for entry change from generation to generation as new religions and varieties of religions emerge. Mystic heaven. The third kind of heaven, earthly heaven. I refer to the paradise of Islam, for example, as one of the earthly heavens. The view of heaven is the reverse of the atheists. The atheists look for heaven on earth. Muslims look for earth in heaven. In other words, the promise is for an afterlife that is very much like life on this earth, except without the natural restrictions. Good food, lovely companions, the total victory of Muslim ideology and Sharia law. That's heaven, paradise. A particular feature of Islam's heaven is that it appeals mainly to men and their human appetites. Number four, silent heaven. Silent heaven. Silent heaven is the heaven of those who view this world as a bad and scary place. It's the heaven of those who have made death their primary reference point in life. Death is the mystery. Death is the peak experience. Murder and violence, the way to power and enlightenment. 
Remember a couple of years back, the Columbine shooters, those two young teenagers dressed in black went in on a shooting spree in a school, kind of kicked off this whole craziness about you know, young people going in and shooting each other in school. Well, the Columbine shooters, they believed in silent heaven because once they tasted the glory of taking life, causing somebody's death, they then sent each other to silent heaven where there is no feeling, there is no awareness, just the quiet sleep of death. Silent heaven is the place that depressed and suicidal people want to go to in order to escape the painful experience of this life. Silent heaven. Then there's sectarian heaven. Sectarian heaven, all those who think that they are the only ones going to heaven because they've understood a special teaching or they follow a certain human leader, these people, they're all going to sectarian heaven. Just you and your special group are going to make it. This is at once the core teaching and it is the core appeal of sectarian heaven. For example, Mormons will spend eternity populating the planets of the universe, according to their leader and founder, Joseph Smith, in uh, some of his writings dating back to 1830. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses, they have a sectarian heaven, they're going to have 144,000 and only that number in their sectarian heaven. A teaching promoted by their founder, Charles Russell, back in 1872. The modern Jewish religion also promotes the idea that only their culture and nation will be uh, reviewed or revived to eternal glory. The biggest clue to knowing if you're headed for sectarian heaven is usually the fact that it's a heaven according to the ideas of just one person and usually a pretty ordinary person at that. Sectarian heaven. Then there's secular heaven. Some people believe that the universe itself is eternal. They believe that it has always been. They can't prove this. It defies logic and science, but they believe this anyways, and they make this the basis of their belief system. In addition to this belief, they also reason that all history is circular in nature. In other words, we simply go round and round repeating the same events. The Big Bang Theory, the Big Bang is both the beginning and the end. It renews itself over and over again. Interesting to note that this is the basis in thinking for time travel and time tunnels in science fiction movies. You're wondering, what's the ideology behind this time travel business? Well, it's this, the eternity of matter. It's why you can't change anything because it'll cause everything to go out of whack. Fate is the byword of those who believe in this circular theory of man's existence. Heaven in this worldview is the ability to get into the groove of history, go with the flow, get your yin and your yang balanced out. Many religions, self-awareness and improvement courses are built on this idea of becoming one with the world around you so that you can find your place in this never ending, once you find your spot in this never ending circular history, I mean, it's a good thing, no more fighting, you got your spot, right? So you found secular heaven when, you've earned, when, when you have learned your, um, your uh, part of the world and what part that you uh, fit into. And then the seventh kind, I call the third heaven. The third heaven. The third heaven is the heaven described in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul refers to this place, and I'll read it for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, if you're reading along in your Bibles. Verse one, he says, boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven, um, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Note here that he refers to it as paradise. Now the person that Paul is referring to may be himself. 
and the occasion, a time when he had, uh, uh, when the Lord revealed himself to Paul in a special way. Now, others in the Bible were permitted a glimpse of this spiritual dimension while still in their human forms. It's talked about in other places. Uh, in Isaiah, for example, Isaiah chapter six, beginning in verse so one, Isaiah describes the vision that he had. He says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe, filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then John writes about the same experience in Revelation chapter four, verse one. He says, after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. And so if you look at the New Testament, you'll see that Jesus himself makes the most references to heaven. Usually he says one of two things about heaven. First, it's a kingdom, meaning that it has structure and rulership and a population of beings. Secondly, it is where he and the Father dwell, suggesting that this is the source of power, uh, excuse me, the source of the power uh, that he himself displayed on earth. Now later on we see Jesus also mention heaven as the ultimate reward for those who believe in him as the Son of God in Luke chapter 6 uh, verse 23. Uh, Peter explains it in detail in his first epistle. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. And so the reward that Peter mentions is basically what? Well, it's perfection. Perfect peace with God, perfect virtue, perfect existence, perfect experience, perfect understanding, perfect joy and power, and all of it perfect forever. Perfect everything because the causes of imperfection, which are Satan's influence and our own personal weakness and sin, those things will not exist in that place. Jesus defeated Satan and wiped away all sin at the cross, Romans chapter six, verse 10. And so the third heaven, as Paul describes it, or paradise, or the kingdom of heaven, all of these refer to the heaven of the Bible, the heaven promised and revealed by God in his word. It is only different, uh, it is not only different than the other heavens that I mentioned, a brief comparison um, immediately shows that it is superior in its essence and its promise as well. That's why I say seven heavens. Which one do you want to go to? Marty and I were joking a little bit before the, the service started and he said, seven heavens, yeah, where are we going to go? Well, yeah, <laughs> you want to go to the right one. Just in case you're wondering, is ours, as Christ, is our heaven better? Well, let's take a look. First of all, it's not a physical or material place. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36. The Bible likens it to physical things like gold and precious gems, you know, in Revelation, but this is imagery used to describe its beauty, not its actual substance. It is experientially far greater than anything this world has to offer. And so the writers of the New Testament at the time, uh, the, the thing that was the most precious is the, the, the imagery that they used to describe heaven. So it's not a material place. It's not a mystical place either, conjured up by the dreams of men. Jesus says that he has come from this realm and he returned to this dimension. 
and he will come once again from this place at the end of the world to bring the church back to this place where only he can lead the way. 2 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. We know Jesus' description of heaven is accurate because his, his resurrection establishes his credibility. All of those other religious leaders who talked about the heaven you know, that they imagined, all those guys are dead. Many of them died in disgrace. And a lot of others in other religions, we don't even know if they actually exist to begin with. But Jesus, we know He existed. We have historical proof of His actual existence. We have eyewitness testimony of the great miracles that He performed. And so the one who is talking to us about heaven has been to heaven, has come from heaven, and is returning from heaven to take us there. And this is a real person who has accomplished real things that we read about uh, in uh, the Bible. The third heaven will be an experience completely, excuse me, completely unlike our experience here on earth. We, we, heaven isn't just earth times two, or the best you can get here frozen so that you always enjoy it. Jesus says that there's no marriage there. Well, why would there be? There's no need for reproduction, why? Well, there's no death. And we will take the form of angels, Matthew 22, verse 30. So if you're wondering, what will I be like? Well, if you have the form of an angel, study what angels are like. You get a little bit of an idea of the power and the essence that you, that we will have in heaven. Never mind better, biblical heaven won't even be anything like our earthly experience. This is why we go there by faith. And biblical heaven is full of rejoicing angels and saints. There's no room for silence. If your heaven, if, if you want to go to <laughs> silent heaven, you're going to be awfully disappointed if you go to the real heaven because there's lots of noise there. <laughs> there is an awareness of self and others as well as an appreciation of God's presence. I know me, I'll know you, and both of us together will know that we're in the presence of God, Revelation 4, 8 to 11. There is peace in heaven, but not a silent, unconscious peace. There is peace because there is no course for war or hatred. All are at peace with one another. That kind of peace. And the third heaven is not populated by just a few of one sect or one culture, but by people of every tribe on earth, rich and poor, male and female, black or white and every shade in between. The only common experience that all share is that they all have been cleansed from their sins in the blood of Jesus Christ and they have each remained faithful unto death. The only common thing that they have. This is not the commands or teachings of men, but the command and teaching of the Lord of heaven, Jesus Christ. Does he not say in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me, where? All authority in heaven and on earth. I can believe what he says about heaven because he has the authority to speak on heaven. The sin that these others have committed in their description of heaven is that they have not been authorized by God to describe what heaven is. Only Jesus has that authority. Only he has the right to describe what heaven is because he comes from there. And then one last contrast between biblical heaven and the others. The heaven of Christ is eternal, but not in a cyclical way promoted by the eternal matter people. In their scheme of things, we continue forever in the same sequence of good and bad, doomed to repeat everything on an endless treadmill. In the third heaven, however, everything will be made new without imperfections 
and the guarantee is that it will always be this way. Revelation 21, 21. If Jesus could take on a weak human body and then live among sinful men in a fallen world, constantly tormented by Satan himself and never sin, 1 Peter 2, 21, 2. Imagine the quality of existence he can give us in a place where none of these impediments exist. This is the third heaven. This is the place reserved for us. This is the promise for those who are faithful to Jesus Christ. So there are many heavens promoted in our world today. I think it's just one more way that Satan in his disguise as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, confuses and leads people astray. You know, more people miss going to heaven because of carelessness, they're just careless with their faith, or ignorance, they buy into these hucksters, then by gross sin, yeah, we have the Hitlers and we have the, you know, these madmen and these terrible people that do terrible things, but most people, they miss going to heaven just because either they're careless with the faith they've been given, they just, you know, they don't take care of it, they don't nourish it. You know, Marty's sermon, boy, timely message. They're a sheep, they just wander off. They're in the flock, they're ready to go, they just wander off. Oh, a shiny thing over here, oh, a shiny thing over there, you know. Or they just don't listen properly. That's usually the reason they don't, get to, they don't get to heaven. There's only one real heaven and it's the heaven described in the Bible. We're not being sectarian when we say this because the teaching is not from some guru or some prophet of the church of Christ or some well-known religious teacher. We know the third heaven's the one because only Jesus has been there and described it to us and confirmed this fact with his resurrection. Anyone could go to the scriptures and find the same thing out for themselves. I'm not declaring something very new that we don't know. No other person has these credentials. No other teacher has a mountain of evidence that proves his claims are true. Now the great part is that it is offered to all and there's no secret, there's no secret knowledge here. The God of heaven through his son Jesus Christ offers everyone the opportunity of joining him there and here's how we go. First we believe that Jesus is what the Bible claims that he is, the son of God and be prepared to acknowledge this before others. Paul the apostle says it this way, that you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, Romans 10, 9. And then repent of your sins and be baptized to receive forgiveness. Or as Peter explains, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. Not just believe in your heart, not just expressing your faith in repentance and baptism, but the entire process from initial faith to final submission in the waters of baptism. This is what God of heaven has commanded us to do. If you've not done this, if you've not obeyed this, if you've not you know, done, you know, if you've done more than this or not enough of this, you haven't obeyed. Of course, you can choose another heaven, I've explained. There might be some other heavens out there. You might want one of the other six heavens. Each has its own course. But if you want to be where Jesus is now, then faith and repentance and baptism, this is the course to follow. And then of course, walking by faith. So please don't put it off. There is no guarantee of tomorrow. Choose the kingdom of heaven and guarantee your place there now by obeying Jesus Christ. And if anyone is here this evening that may need to do that, then of course we offer this invitation that you might take this opportunity to come and confess Christ or maybe come and confess the fact that you've been one of those that have kind of wandered off, 
been careless with your faith, maybe need some strength to renew it and to remain faithful, that's okay. That's, that's, a, that's a legit prayer. And our elders are here, of course, to answer that prayer and to, and to pray on your behalf. So if anyone needs to respond in any way, please come now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.